Good morning. It's good to see all your happy, smiling, frowning. Anyway, it's good to be here. God is good. Amen. Careful. If he's good all the time, you can never complain again. I'm going to share a few things just that's on my heart. The Lord threw some scriptures at me, and then I was going to talk about the life of faith. Now, we've heard so much teaching on faith, but um, as you can tell by now, I don't teach things the way most people have taught them. I can't be an echo of another man's revelation. I must be able to share what God has given me. You can't be an echo of anybody else's revelation. You must learn to hear the Lord for yourself and speak what he shares with you. Because if we're doing what the Lord said, then every facet of revelation that we glean adds to a greater picture of the whole. You know, this is not going to work. Let's do this. And then we can move forward from there. Because scripture does teach us, we learn line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We go from glory to glory. And as the body of Christ, we are members in particular, but we create one whole. Therefore, we need each other and we need to hear from you what God has revealed to you. That makes up the difference. Otherwise, we find ourselves thinking we're the only ones that know anything. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen or no? Amen. Now, I'm going to start with Matthew 23, 13. Jesus is speaking to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, woe to you. Let me stop there. In Scripture, a woe was when a prophet would pronounce a judgment. There was no promise, if you do this, then this is the result, or if you don't do this, this is the result. Your choices are over, you've made your stand, now you're going to face the judgment of God for what you've done. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut up the kingdom of heaven from men you neither enter in yourselves, nor do you allow anybody else to enter in. Now, how could they shut up the kingdom of heaven from anybody entering in? Let's continue. Verse 14, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive the greater condemnation. 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as you are yourselves. Ouch. I don't think they're having a good day. 16, woe to you, blind guides who say, whoever swears by the sanctuary, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the sanctuary is obligated. You fools and blind men, for what is more important, the gold or the sanctuary that holds the gold, that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the, the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar, swears by both the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the sanctuary, swears by both the sanctuary and by him who dwells in it. Hmm. And whoever swears by heaven, swears by both the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. 
But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out gnat, a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside there are, they are full of robbery and self-indulgent. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Everything Jesus was pronouncing a judgment upon them for were works of the flesh masquerading as acts of God. You can tell by his judgments that they were more concerned with an appearance of holiness while coveting the riches of man and neglecting basic things that Scripture teaches. That's the summary of all of this. We have no difference today in the church than what Jesus pronounced woes against them for. We have those that masquerade as, as shepherds, but they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Their whole motivation is not to see people not just redeemed, but established in the kingdom and becoming more like Christ. No, they're more interested in making money and becoming famous with their music and having private jets and large homes. And in this hour, Jesus is pronouncing a woe. Most of that, if not all of that, that was... Uh, rendered or come by through deception, manipulation, and the wrong spirit is not only going to be exposed, it's going to be removed from them. The Lord is coming back for a church without spot and blemish. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, I used to read that and think, Lord, that's going to be the greatest miracle I have ever witnessed ever because have you been to the churches I've been to? <laughs> that was a dumb question. <laughs> a church without spot or blemish, mature, faultless, walking in the fullness of who he is. That's what he's returning for. How do you purify gold? How do you purify silver? In fire. And to get the purest of those elements, you turn up the fire seven times hotter. Hence, we come to the end of the age where darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people, where the pressures of everything in this reality are building to a crescendo. You know, the scripture says that all of creation groans awaiting the coming forth of mature sons. That word groan is the same word used in when Paul's speaking of praying in the Holy Spirit with groanings that cannot be articulated in natural speech. You're having more earthquakes in one day now than you used to have in 100 years. 5.0 and greater. Creation is groaning at a staggering rate. The changes in just the earth right now, and let me, it's not, it's not because of greenhouse gases in your car. One volcano puts out more greenhouse gas than a nation does in a year. You have 248 active volcanoes right now. All of creation is groaning. The heavens there are weird things happening in the heavens, unusual things that even science can't identify. Weather patterns, they're coming up with new names to define what's happening with weather. I'm sure you've all seen crazy weather things happening. Well, can I say we haven't seen anything yet? That's just the warm-up. There are things happening that points to this moment in Scripture where Jesus said, there will be wars and rumors of wars. 
there will be signs in the heaven above and the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors, and on and on and on. It's happening right now in this generation in our lifetime. And it's accelerating very quickly. Jesus is looking for a people that are willing to be divested of their worldly mindset and their worldly accoutrements. And I don't mean you're going to live on the street. He's looking for a people that are sold out and bowled out. Amen. We're called to be lights in the midst of this end time darkness. Not hidden away ones. And much of the church, when they talk about a rapture or catching away, they think, well, I don't care what's happening in the world, we're getting out of here. That attitude is going to lead you to staying here. Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith in the earth? If you're sitting on your blessed assurance, there's no faith. Faith is action. It causes us to do what he says to do, not out of obligation, but because of love. When you think you have an obligation to do something, now you're starting down the path of religious protocol. Religious protocol is why Jesus pronounced woes on all those Pharisees, Sadducees, and lawyers. They kept people from entering the kingdom. Why? Because of their religious position. I've taught and said on this for years, I've talked against a spirit of religion, not people. People are snared by a spirit of religion. We all were once there. Some of us are still dabbling in certain mindsets. But do you understand a religious system is the antithesis of faith? It will keep you from faith and establish your feet strongly in works. I have to do this. I have to measure up. I have to work this out. I, I, I. And you know what? There's no faith in that. There's too much of you and nothing's going to be accomplished but a dead work. We have to come back to the simplicity that's in the gospel, simplicity that's in the word where Jesus said, follow me. Simple. Follow me. How much easier can that be? except for our programming where everybody else says, follow me, and we choose which one we like best and follow that. Jesus said, follow me. And the only one in Scripture that said, follow me, other than Jesus was Paul. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. That means you must know how Christ conducted his, himself and went about doing what he did so that you can recognize if Paul is doing the same thing. In other words, we must be a people that can discern and judge fruit, not gifting. Still with me? He goes on and on. Verse 27 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. In this way you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I shared with you about my time at TBN in the late 70s and how they would get on with this great gift and God would do extraordinary things, but they came off that set or away from that pulpit and their lives were putrid. Do you know... In the later years of that corporation, corporation, their alcohol bill for the green room was over $50,000 a month. It seems there was a culture of imbibing in alcohol before you came on the set and after you left the set of this Christian ministry. What in the world happened? A little leaven led to a great apostasy. The scripture teaches us, do not despise the days of small beginnings. Why? Remember it. Remember the simplicity by which you started. Remember the 
the, the, the reliance that you had upon the Lord and His Spirit because there was nothing you could do. Remember, don't despise that. Stay in that place of dependence upon the Lord. And that will carry you through to the end. But when we start prospering in what God has called us to, let me say that again. When we start prospering in what God has called us to, we've crossed over to the wrong side. When Jesus can prosper through us in what he's called us to do, we're still safe. In other words, you must be pointing to Jesus at all times and never at yourself. I never get so uncomfortable in my life as when people come up and say, start trying to praise me for a message or something. It's like, I'm just a conduit. Stop thanking me. Thank him and thank the Holy Spirit. You know, one day I was studying a lot of the... Uh, Stories in the Old Covenant, and I, you know, you come to Balaam. This man was a prophet that was obviously very accurate, but he sold out his gift for mammon. He became prophet for hire. Never met any of those. Until finally he was so apostate away from the heart and the will of God, it had almost cost him his life. Now, this is a, you know, the story. He's going someplace he's not supposed to, and the, the donkey's bucking, and he's beating it, and finally the donkey speaks and says, Stop! You're going to kill us both! Now he's even more angry. You, you ever wondered? <laughs> the donkey's speaking. He's not surprised. He's just angry. Stupid donkey, who told you? I'm like, can you get so lost that when something that spectacular, supernatural happens, you're just kind of oblivious? Yes. So I, you know, I was studying, my goodness, how come an animal can be more spiritually attuned than a prophet? You ever noticed how really uh, certain times when there's a presence in your house or there's an angel or demonic, your animals know, they can discern? Just the pastor, okay. Got to work on these people. Amen? Yes. You ever notice that? They're very sensitive to the spirit realm. Even little children, toddlers can be very sensitive to the spirit realm. What happened to us? Well, we become hardened by the world, by the distraction of the world, by the things in the world. And then at some point, if we get a have a desire to really want to reconnect, oftentimes we go about it the wrong way and end up connecting in the wrong way and we're led astray. We have to come back to simplicity. I hope you hear nothing else today but this. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the Word. Follow Jesus. If you have any question about anything you don't have to go to anybody. Go back to the Word. Lord, what do you say about this? And then follow Jesus. Amen? Now, he says in Mark chapter 7, verse 5, And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? but eat their bread with defiled hands. And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commands of men, leaving the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men. When I went to Bible college, I... I my dad got saved through Full Gospel Businessmen, which is a bunch of non-scholarly, biblically trained guys that had an encounter with God, that fell in love with the Lord, that started doing what the Word said, praying for one another and ministering to one another and worshiping together. They were doing great. 
And that was the environment we began in in the kingdom. And then we moved to a small charismatic church where the pastor encouraged everybody to be involved by praying for each other and prophesying, doing all of that stuff. So now I go to Bible college. It's a, it's a you better be careful. It's a Bible college that was supposed to believe in the charismatic lifestyle. When I got to the Bible college, I was doing okay. And then about a month in, I had a friend in the evening. He said, man, I have a horrible migraine. I can't get rid of it. And I said, well, did anybody pray for you? And he said, no. Well, so you want me to pray? He said, oh, okay. And it was not even on the radar that you go to God first. Said, okay, that happens. I prayed for him. God healed him. Boom. Another person got healed. Boom. Another person saw that and said, I've been wanting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Got filled. Why? Because I'd been taught just to believe the word. That went on for a few nights, and after a few nights, the campus pastor and the dean came and said, you stop doing that, you have no authority. And I was shocked. I went, uh, my first thought is, is this a cult? I was naive. I said, what Bible do you read? He said, what that's gotta, what's that got to do with anything? We read the King James. Okay, same Bible I read. I don't understand. You haven't finished Bible school. You have no authority to do this. I said, oh, D did Peter get that memo? <laughs> Where in the Bible that's supposed to be the standard do you come up with, I can't do what the word says until I have been indoctrinated into your belief system? I backed off. It is their campus, not mine. I was just shocked. I, I'd never seen anything like that. See, they made traditions based upon their belief system that shut out God. Until you believed like they did and you operated as they operated, and then they might give you liberty to do a little bit. I was grieved. I was rudely awakened to the spirit of religion that up to that point I had been very naive about. And so what they do is they create after their own kind others that have the same mindset. So you perpetrate, you continue on with the same exclusive only us, nobody else. God have mercy. Leaving the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. He says in verse 13, you're invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you have handed down. And you do many such things. It's very clear in scripture. Jesus said, follow me. In Hebrew, Jesus was known as a Karaite. A Karaite is a scripturalist. That's why he said, you say, but scripture says. You say, but scripture says. He was always telling them what they said was not accurate. Come back to the word. He was a scripturalist. He stood on the word himself. In John 14, 12, Jesus said, the works that I do, some of you might do. Is that what he said? Can you hear me now? No. He said, the works I do shall you do also. What did he do? He relied on the word of God and the God of the word. Not the traditions of men. That canceled the power of the word of God. And by the way, in Matthew 23, when Jesus said, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in, that in the Aramaic and the Greek means you don't enter in and you don't let anybody else enter in to the kingdom. 
that's not a positional entering in. That's not just a confessional entering in. That's a stepping in in the full context of what Jesus purchased by his blood so that you live in a dimension of life as a new creation that has not been witnessed before on the earth. John 14, John 4, 17, the last part of the verse says, as he is, so are you in this world. Let me say that again. As he is. What is Jesus like right now? Does he ever get sick? Is he ever worried? Any lack? Any discomfort? Any fear, doubt, unbelief? As he is right now, so are you in this world. Now here comes tradition. Well, he doesn't really mean that. What he's saying is because you're in him and, and, and see intellect begins to enter in and cancel out reality. The word of God is the reality. The intellect of man is the facade. Unless that intellect is surrendered and sanctified and given to God, it will always lead you away from the Lord. That's why upper division courses, I call them Bible cemeteries now, not seminaries. The vast, vast majority of them, as well as Bible schools at this time, are putting, pushing out humanistic ministries at best that don't believe the word, don't rely upon the word, but pontificate over the word. We have to be a people of the word lest God pronounces a woe on us. He's looking for a people of faith. Lord, I don't understand it, but your word says it. I choose to believe it. How can I believe something I don't understand? I make a choice. I make a choice. We make choices every single day. Matter of fact, the word says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Well, uh... I think I'll serve my flesh today. Got some things I want to do. No. That's not what you're supposed to do, but you have the freedom to do that. Well, I think I'll serve my... Uh, well, why don't you just choose to serve the Lord and make that a habit? So he went through this whole litany of condemning traditions that keep people away from the reality of the kingdom. And he ended it with verse 20 in Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 23. He said, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, sexual immorality, thefts, murders, adulteries, covetous, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile a man. In other words, all the traditions that keep you from the reality of the kingdom opens the door to you being defiled with an intellectual approach that, it's, that, it, that invites the world in. Do you know... There was a grace message that started going around that says you've been forgiven once, you can live like the devil and still go to heaven. Do you know they were in Bible colleges teaching the youth this? Well, no, you can fornicate and live together and do drugs and party and do all that because you're saved. You don't have to ask forgiveness anymore because it's, it's done. What in the world's coming forth from that? Do you believe that? No, you better not. But, but that's what's, what's been presented. As a matter of fact, I don't know what it's like here, but in America, the moment they made legal the marijuana usage, those that were in Bible colleges said, hey, let's go out and just smoke a few joints together because it's legal now. What? What does the word have to say about that? Well, they didn't know and they really didn't care because their flesh was in the preeminent position, not their spirit man. This is consistently taking place in the world right now. 
If you're not one of those that thinks like that, then you need to thank God because he put that grace in your life. If you're starting to move towards that type of apostasy, you need to ask God to help you. So we come to verse 24. Jesus stood up and went away from, that, from there to the region of Tyre. He left where the Pharisees had been spewing forth garbage, and he went into a remote region, and he entered into a house, and he didn't want anybody to know of it, yet he couldn't escape notice. I like that. If you're doing what God's told you to do, and Jesus is evidently in you, People are going to notice Jesus in you. There's always needy people in the world. Notice I said they're going to notice Jesus in you, not you, Steve Stunning Evangelist or Prophet Profound. No. They should be looking to Jesus. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came, fell at his feet. And this woman was a Greek or a Syrophoenician, Syrophoenician descent, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. In another translation, it says, she fell at his feet and worshipped him, saying, help my daughter. That's an interesting worship. Help. Why would that cry be worship? Because it's a recognition of the only one who can. Do you understand when you recognize his sovereignty and his ability and his, he's the only solution? That is worship. Not just wonderful songs. I did a study some years ago on this, what prayer really means. You know, there's petition, there's intercession, there's all sorts of things, but one of them is complaint. That's one of the meanings of prayer, complaint. I laughed and said, God, people pray more often than I ever thought. He said, yeah, but they're not complaining to me about a condition. They're complaining to everybody else. Ouch. So who are they praying to? Complaints are part of the human condition. Unfortunately, the solution has not become evident to all. So she's crying out. She kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he say, was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Ouch. I just want my daughter delivered, and you're calling me a dog on top of it. Well, that terminology in the Aramaic or the Greek literally means a, a beloved family pet. Something that's part of the family, but has a different standard of existence, if you will. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said, wow, I haven't seen faith like this in Israel. Be it done unto you according to your faith. And she went home and her daughter had been delivered. Now you move over to another story a few chapters later of a woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years and could not, as she spent everything she had, couldn't be healed. She's a daughter of Abraham. In other words, she's a covenantal daughter. That means in order for her to even be in public, everywhere she went, she had to cry out, unclean, unclean, so people would back away from her and not touch her or get near her. Can you imagine 12 years of nobody even touching you? Never a hug, never a kind word or gesture. That's the existence she had. That's why she was so desperate. She heard about this miracle worker named Jesus of Nazareth. So what did she do? She came up with a plan, a plan that will cost her her life, by the way. She's going to sneak through the crowd. That's a death sentence in the Hebraic culture because she's unclean. But she sneaks through this crowd. Everybody's all around him. She touches just the hem of his tallit. And instantly she's healed, and Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? And the disciples, the worldly disciples went, really, Lord? I mean, like, we got this whole mob pushing on us, and you're saying, everybody's touching you. 
And I could just see Jesus going, boy, he, come on. There was a touch of faith that obviously you don't understand yet. Who touched me? And, she, and it says when she realized she'd been found out, she, she confessed. Now, in that confession, she knew she was dead, but she also knew she was healed. I guess she's happy to die now that she's healed, if that's the end result. See, what has your faith cost you? Well, she was willing to die. What has our faith cost us? A little discomfort? A little bit of ridicule? Misunderstanding, becoming the black sheep of the family, being ostracized by your friends, being persecuted. What has your faith cost you? Because if it hasn't cost you anything, you better go back to the drawing board and find out if there's any faith involved. Or if God called you to exercise your faith in that arena. And when Jesus saw what she had done, he said, woman, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Now, here's the contrast, and here's the difference between tradition and simple faith in following Jesus. The Syrophoenician woman, the Greek, the Gentile, was not going to have the gospel preached to them for about another 20 years. Healing did not belong to the Gentiles at that point. But this other woman came and stole a healing. Now, that's just not fair. Why did she have to contend and fight? This one just took. Because that one didn't have a covenant yet, and this one, the daughter of Abraham, had a covenant. Healing belonged to her. So she came and took it. Our mindset, the way we're taught by religion, is we're still out here having to beg and plead and contend and ask, and hopefully he'll give us a crumb. But we're on this side of the cross now, not that side. The gospel's been preached to us. We have access now to receive and take exactly what belongs to us by covenant. Religion keeps you from relationship. Covenant means it's already yours. Covenant means you have free access. Covenant means you don't have to go through this protocol of whatever it is in each denomination that they establish that keeps you from that relationship and that place of intimacy to just walking in and saying, sitting on your father's lap and saying, just wanted to be with you, daddy. Well, you're not clean enough. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not anointed enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not fat enough. You're not tall enough. You're not short enough. We've all heard all of these things. A good friend of ours in Singapore that's gone home to be with the Lord quite a few years ago, his name was David Richards. He was a, uh, from New Zealand, married a Malaysian woman, lived in Singapore, passionate for God. Once he got saved, he was passionate for God. And his way of serving was any time a ministry came in into Singapore, if he knew about it, he would go and he'd drive you around, he'd buy you the meals, he'd do, he just loved to do this because he wanted to glean, he wanted to hear. And one day he was taking this individual around from America who was somebody, and this guy's having a special meeting for those that are called to prophetic ministry. And he says, well, can I come? He said, have you ever prophesied? No. Have you ever had a dream or vision? Well, I don't think so. You ever done that? He said, well, you, obviously you have no call to ministry. And he was devastated. And when I heard this, I just saw red. I was like, ah. How can you destroy a, a passionate heart? Who made people judges in their own intellectual, I'm not even going to say astuteness. So we started taking Dave under our wings and said, you absolutely have an anointing. So whenever we were there ministering, I said, Dave, come up and pray. 
come and do it with us. And we just started releasing him and activating him. And finally, because he hadn't done the Bible college, and he couldn't you know, get a license. Or, I said, no, you're part of our ministry. And I gave him a license and we ordained him. And he was off to the races. Amen. We're called to encourage each other in love to do the work of the ministry. We're called to remove the obstacles to becoming like Christ instead of building walls that say, oh, you're not good enough. This world is desperately in need of true believers in Christ. Desperately. Is that you? Is that me? Do I model for the kingdom what Jesus asked me to model? Or am I still doing my own thing in my own way according to my own desires? Well, Paul said this. Galatians 1, I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel which has been proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. Yes, or as we have said before, I say now again, if anyone is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. You receive Jesus freely by faith. If anybody begins to warp that and twist that, Paul himself says, let that one be accursed. Ouch. Well, we've got to have protocol. There is a protocol. Follow him. There is a protocol. Grow up into him. There is a protocol. Love him. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind according to the word of God. I can't tell you how much I had to study about the doctrines of a specific denomination if I wanted to go to that particular Bible college. And really, it's an indoctrination. It didn't say we believe the word of God this way. It says we believe this way, and sometimes it lined up with the word of God. Look, I'm not saying every single place is like that. Do you understand? You decide by discernment in the word of God. For I am, am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Well, at that time, because I wanted to be credentialed, I was seeking whose favor? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I I would not be a slave of God, of Christ. Who are we willing to serve and for what's, what's the price? My dad and I, before he went home, we, we used to have long discussions about this. It was very good, but long discussions about this. See, he never went to a Bible college. I, I, I went to a Bible college. He never went to a Bible college. And yet, in the crusades he held, and in the works he did, there were, now, up to now, there's thousands of churches, probably millions of people have come to Christ by a man who just believed the word. We had friends that were leaders in all sorts of denominations. And at one time, you know, you start thinking, well, maybe I should hang my hat in one of these. And they all said, you know what they all said? Don't. These were the superintendents. Don't do that because if you come into this stream, you'll never be able to minister outside of this stream. Stay independent. Or in other words, keep following Jesus. 
And wherever there's hunger, wherever there's people that are passionate for him, it doesn't matter which stream they're in, when they see the grace that's on your life, you'll have an open door. We have been to some very interesting places with very hungry people. One of my favorite was a gypsy church in Spain. That was fun. That was an education there. Amazing. Follow him. Follow him. Well, I want miracles and I want to see signs and wonders. Well, <laughs> religious protocol is not going to let that happen. Let me, let me tell you a true story. In the Midwest of America, where the, the ranch country, there was an uh, old farmer there, rancher, I should say, and he had milk cows, right? So one day, yeah, he just simple faith in the word of God, and his cow was whatever cows do to get sick. I don't know what it was, but he knew. And he, he read in the word, if, you know, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And he, didn't, he said, well, it didn't just mean, say people. So he decided he's going to lay hands on the sick, and he remembered James 5, but he was out in the field. He didn't have any oil, so he just went, put his hands on his cow and prayed, and the cow recovered. And from there on, he, that's all he would do. He would just pray over his Well, the other ranchers heard about what he's doing, and he got a reputation for being able to come and pray for their cows and, and heal them. So the local charismaniac church invited him in, and said, give us your testimony, you know, we want your testimony. And so he shared the testimony of his faith and how he got saved. And, and the pastor said, okay, we're going to have a prayer line here. And uh, Farmer Fred's going to be over here. And I and the elders will be over here. And if you have any need for healing, just line up and we'll pray for you. Well, the people lined up on his side. He'd just go, <laughs> be healed. They'd drop and get up, totally healed. Over here, Pastor Profound and his elders are getting the oil and Nothing. Nothing. And these people, after they got nothing, went over here and got healed. And it became a contest. Why? They had religious protocol. He had simple faith. Followed the word. The revelation. The rhema that God gave him. That's the difference. Religion keeps you from reality. Keeps you from relationship. Amen or oh no? Amen. Now he's talking... He goes on in Galatians. He says, verse 13, For you have heard of my... Oh no, let's start in 11. For I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which I proclaim as good news is not according to man. In other words, I didn't get this from anybody. The revelation I share with you, I don't receive from anybody else. I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I got a rhema. I got a revelation. I had an encounter. And that's what I share. You know, I, I have a number of Bible software uh, platforms on my computer. And a lot of them have Bible commentaries. I don't like Bible commentaries. Oh, they might have a place, but I don't... Re See... That's another man's research, their study, their thoughts, their revelation, and it's from a hundred years ago. Let me give you a for instance. Israel, this is commentary. Israel served its purpose in birthing the Messiah. After that, God's done with them. They'll never be a nation again. They'll never be significant in the world again. They had one reason only, to kill the Messiah. That's revelation from 100 years ago, or 120 now. That was totally intellectually off the mark. Had nothing to do with Scripture. So why do I want to go there and bring that into my life and use it? I don't. I want to hear from God. I do my own word studies. You want to hear from God. Dig in the word. He, he's got so much he wants to give you.
What's your name? Yeah. Shane. You've always had a hunger, Shane. I've, I've seen it on you before. We've, I, don't, I forget how many places we've seen you, but as <laughs> long as it's not in my nightmares, I mean, in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> but it's increased in you. And you feel an urgency in your spirit now that is even greater than you've ever known before. And, and there's a, a knowing, but not a clarity. There's a knowing, but not a clarity. And the Lord has kept the clarity from you because if he showed you with clarity what your knower knows, it would hinder you in your passionate pursuit. But I want to encourage you, you're almost to the place of a particular breakthrough that's going to put jet engines on that passion and it's going to be an acceleration from this day forward. You have been carrying... Since before the foundation of the world where God knew you, a specific revelation and purpose for the end of the age, and it's about to be revealed. You've had a heart for specific things. God says, don't think so small. Just remain pliable and teachable. You've dreamed about seeing miracles. He says, hang on to that because they're coming now. And there is a great awakening you are part of, not going to be. You are a part of it. And that great, great, great awakening has to begin in somebody. And that great awakening begins with a passion for him. You're all well on your way. You're well, to, you're well on your way through that breakthrough. And God's going to perfect those things that have come to stop you or hinder you or block you. You're going to dance upon injustice and laugh because it's finished. So rejoice. Amen. Verse 13, you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Is there anybody like that today that persecutes the church of God that's in the church of God? Oh, I could name a few, but I won't name names. Oh, you tongue talkers. That's of the devil. God doesn't heal anymore. There's no such things or dreams or visions anymore. That's not scriptural. You know what my favorite little rebuttal to that is I got to start carrying more but a little packet of scissors and I said good here's some scissors let's go to these scriptures so we can cut them out of your Bible because obviously they mean zero to you so let's just cut them out and get rid of them and then you could say it's not in my Bible we would rather hang our hat on man's intellect than that unsafe place quote unquote of God's revelation. Do you know what revelation is? It's discovery. Do you know what heaven is? Eternal discovery. You can have tastes of it now and an eternity of it later or you can enter into the eternity of it now and the continuation later. Most people are happy with the one simple revelation that quote-unquote gets their ticket punched. They're going to heaven. Little do they know. Amen. I'm going to finish up here. Are we still friends? He said, verse 16, 15, But when God who had set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased... To reveal his son in me so that I might proclaim him as a good, a good news among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So there came a time of fulfillment. God's timing and purpose. Even though Saul was going in the wrong direction, doing the wrong thing, killing God's people. But at the appropriate time, God stopped him. 
And then when he received a revelation, he didn't immediately go to others and say, what do you think? I used to do that. I went to God and said, Father, clarify. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, give me greater understanding. Bring it forth according to your word. And as you do learn to do that, you have a firm foundation on which you can now stand. And I go back to what I said yesterday. The person with the experience is never at the mercy of the person with the theology. God doesn't raise the dead. He only did that in those days. Yes, he does. Plenty of people have been raised from the dead. I used to, you know who David Hogan is? He's had almost over 500 people raised from the dead in his ministry. Matter of fact, if you're going to be in any position of leadership in his ministry, you have to have raised at least one person from the dead. So we, we got to meet him once, and some friends of ours know him. And I said, hey, next time you t see uh, David Hogan, you tell him, I have raised far more people from the dead than he ever has. He said, yep. Every Sunday when I dismiss the people, they come alive, and whew, they're gone. <laughs> so he went and told David Hogan that. And David Hogan looked and went, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> Raising of the dead. And you know what? Raising of the dead is not the pinnacle of faith. It's entry-level Christianity. Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8. Before the cross. No, a transformed life is the pinnacle. And then in verse, chapter 2, I'll give you verse 2 and we'll close. He said, after 14 years... He went up after three years, told him what the Lord had said. Then he went back after 14 years. Now he's in ministry. He said, I went up because of a revelation. I was led of the Spirit before I went anywhere. We must be led of the Spirit. Amen or oh no? Let's go back to the simple things. Be led of the Spirit. Follow Jesus. Don't get entangled with world systems or religious systems that keep you from reality. Follow him. It's the most exciting adventure you will ever enter into. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is truth. Your heart is that we know you and follow you. And in this season, this hour, this world with so many voices vying for our attention, crying out for us to heed them and follow them, we can make a choice every day to lay all of that down, come before you and hear what you're saying and do what you tell us to do. I ask that you would fortify your people in their inner man, strengthen them to be able to do just that, and release the grace I'm reminded again of John 5, 19, of my own self, I can do nothing. Most people have tried and failed innumerable times to walk in the simplicity. But Lord, your grace is sufficient. So I'm asking you in the hour of the greatest pressure this world's ever seen or will see, you would begin to perfect your character in us, to give us an ear to hear with clarity, eyes to see, and a heart to understand. Bless your people with this, I pray in Jesus' name.